Hey there folks, I am Blunty and this is the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera and I've had the pleasure and privilege to spend the last 11 days or so tooling around with one. This video will be all about the hardware and throughout the week that follows I'll be posting follow-up videos on the results with native Micro Four Thirds lenses, adapted and manual lenses, testing the internal codec versus recording externally via an Atomos Ninja 2, uh, we'll look at the time-lapse mode, I'll also have a few shot-for-shot -shot shootout comparisons with other leading cameras in this kind of area. There will be lots of content with lots and lots of sample, demo and test shots for you all to pick at, graded and ungraded and in as many lighting conditions as I could manage. Now like I said, this video will be all about the hardware and the interface and it will also be pretty exhaustive, so unless you're actually interested in owning this camera or really, really in love with the sound of my Australian drawl, then you might get a bit bored quite honestly, but anyway. Let's get down and dirty with some mother loving detail of this Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Beastie. Now being that it is designed as a professional level tool, not as a tourist's point and shoot happy snapper type camera or a shiny new toy for the weekend wedding photographer types, if you're thinking about this camera because it has the word cinema in its name and you're thinking that that means you can get James Cameron-ish looking shots of your kid's soccer match, but you don't know your shutter angle from your elbow, then you need to rethink your options. Make no mistake about it. This tool is designed for working professionals. It makes no compromises for easy mode stuff. It's got nothing in there for amateur shooters at all. And that means if you don't know what you're doing, if you normally rely on auto or semi-auto priority modes, then you're going to have a bad time with this camera and your shots will look like garbage. And because you don't know what you're doing, you will be probably tempted to blame the camera because they look like garbage. But it's not the camera, it's you. And if you newbies aren't demoralized enough by now, for those of you out there who have whined about the quote-unquote small sensor, it is the same size, quite deliberately, as a frame of Super 16 film. And I dare you to dig into Google and find out what award-winning, critically acclaimed cinematic masterpieces and even popular TV shows have been shot entirely on Super 16 or used Super 16 in their productions. And once you've done that, then I dare you to shut the hell up up and feel incomprehensibly stupid for ever claiming that a sensor of this size isn't appropriate for professional cinematic work, because I'm sick of noobs and forum whores parroting on about it. So those rants out of the side, the camera body itself is tiny, and as I showed in my unboxing, it's about the same width and height as an iPhone 5, and only about uh, four times as thick at its widest point, its widest point being the grip, of course. It's very comfortable in the hand, the grip is broad and the slightly rubbery finish leads to a very confident grip. It's weighty without feeling heavy, and the balance is pretty good, even with larger glass. And in fact, it's so small, once you do grip it, the camera all but disappears. All you can see from the front is the lens. There's no bulk, no concessions to fashion or exuberant design flourishes. No lumps, no bumps, nothing that isn't absolutely essential to just getting the job done. And it is easily the most stealthy camera I've ever used. No one on the street looks twice at it. For all the casual observer knows, it's just a happy snapper point and shoot. Especially when you've got a smaller lens on it. And guerrilla filmmakers will absolutely love it for its anti rentacop stealth factor. The ergonomics of the controls are okay, but not great. For me, the record button is a bit too far to the right edge, forcing my finger back into a kind of unnatural position. And the same is true for the back controls. They don't quite fall under thumb as naturally as I'd like. This will, of course, vary from person to person, but I can only tell you what it's like in my hand, can't I? The rear buttons are all flush with the body, and only in the case of the directional pad do they sit in a slight well. This causes issues when you're trying to use them while filming, as none of the buttons are pronounced enough for you to confidently use them by feel alone. You have to look for them, then use them. Now perhaps that is not a huge issue when filming with the naked camera alone, but if you're using something like a viewfinder loop, then this becomes a bit of a pain in the ass, and it is a real problem if you want to quickly trigger an iris adjustment or toggle one of the two focused picking options on and off. 
Underneath is the battery and media door. A slight annoyance to have it on the bottom as if you've got the camera in a cage or are using it with some kind of rig, there's the potential to obstruct easy and fast access to the battery and the media card. And seeing as even in its more space efficient ProRes mode, it'll obliterate 32 gigs worth of memory card in just 22 minutes of shooting, easy access to swap out the card is pretty essential. Fortunately though, I tested it with both a Manfrotto 323 quick release plate, also more commonly known as the RC2 system, and a small Arca Swiss compatible quick release plate, and in both cases the door remained utterly unfettered. And considering that these smaller quick release systems are by far the more likely candidates to be used in a camera of this size, it's an issue that shouldn't be a real world problem for most users out there. And while we're down here, a note on battery life. It uses a Nikon type EEL EN20 battery, and the one that comes with the camera is just 800 milliamp hours. And I've also been testing with a pair of aftermarket 900 milliamp hour versions, which cost me about $12 each. There are even higher capacity version batteries available. And you will be wanting extra batteries, by the way. With a standard Micro Four Third lens with no stabilization in it, you'll get just short of an hour run and record time. With a stabilized lens, which of course uses more power for the stabilization function, you'll get closer to 30 or 40 minutes. And with a completely manual lens that doesn't use any power at all, you'll get just over an hour or so. And this time can vary depending on temperature too. The Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera, like its bigger brothers, apparently uses an active cooling system to keep the sensor temperature under control, and thus keeping you shooting for longer and preventing heat-induced sensor noise. But being an active system, it does mean it needs power to run, so shooting longer takes under a midday summer sun will probably cost you some noticeable battery life. And on the topic of heat, the camera will run warm under prolonged use. Warm, not hot. Even under my more aggressive testing, it never got warm enough to make me concerned, but it certainly is a noticeable warmth. Back to the SD cards. The camera is very picky when it comes to memory cards. It will refuse to recognize some SD cards altogether when you shove them inside. Others may be recognized but aren't quite fast enough to keep up with the very large and demanding data rates required to be dumped onto it, causing dropped frames and frustration. Now let me be clear, this is not a flaw with the camera. It's a flaw with some memory cards. Some are just crap, and some are deceptively labelled, talking about their peak data rates and not the sustainable constant data rates, which may be very different things indeed. The ones I've been using with 100% success rate are the SanDisk Extreme Pro cards. They're easily one of the best, most reliable, consistent cards you can buy which is why they cost more, and that can hurt at purchase time, but in my opinion, it's an investment in a worry-free filming future that is absolutely worth making. And if you peek into the camera's manual, you'll see that even Blackmagic themselves recommend that you use these cards. Oh, and another tip, do make sure you buy them from an authorized dealer, not some iffy website. Because the sand disks are so awesome, it also makes them a popular target for the cheapo Chinese knockoff cards that will only cause you misery and regret. Now, back to the camera. There's a quarter 20 thread on the bottom and top plate of the camera. In both cases, they are, of course, fully metal and seem to be seated very securely. I hung an Atomos Ninja 2 complete with both batteries from a magic arm attached to the top of the camera, and there was no sign of strain or stress or flexing that would indicate that doing this regularly would be any kind of issue at all. And in general, aside from the slightly flimsy feeling battery door and plastic buttons, the build quality does feel utterly superb. It's almost like it was carved from a single slab of material. The ports at the side, which include power, HDMI out, microphone, headphone, and link connectors all feel nicely seated too. And yes, you can power the camera from the DC and charge your battery and film all at the same time, although of course this will slow down charging. If you turn the camera off and plug your power in, it actually charges the battery up quite quickly indeed. The lens mount is of course all metal and has a nice big release button to make swapping out lenses fast, fiddle-free, and easy. 
So let's talk about the display now. It's a 3.5 inch 800 by 480 screen, which certainly isn't a mind blowing resolution, but it is good enough to properly frame your shots and get a decent bead on your focus. A simple info strip across the bottom gives you your current settings, mode and battery level. Although infuriatingly, the time counter only counts for the currently recording clip. There is apparently no way to see what your total recording time is or even estimate how much recording time you've got left. You can't even see how much space is left on the SD card so you can estimate it yourself with some brain math. And on a camera designed for a professional, this is unforgivable and can cause all manner of frustrations in a shoot. Alright camera operator, do we have enough record time left for another take? Who knows? Did someone take notes on how long every last shot was with a pen and paper so then we can add them all up and do the calculations to see how much space we got left and and do more calculations based on the average bit rate of a clip and do some maths if we see if we can estimate how much disk space we've used and how much we've got ah! it's idiotic not to be able to check how much space you've used on your recording media and it's unforgivable that this is missing even more idiotic is the complete inability to format a card in camera and you need to do this because it has to be in a very specific format or it won't work at all. And that very specific format is not the same format as you will get if you format it in another camera or in the default settings on your computer or even how they come out of the packages. You can't even use the camera to delete a shot that you screwed up or simply don't need in order to try and free up more of the precious and rapidly depleted recording time. And these are complaints that have existed for every single model of Blackmagic cameras. When or if they are ever going to respond or fix this infuriating shortcoming is utterly unknown. And it causes much flailing and gnashing of teeth in any forum which discusses these cameras. Please Blackmagic, fix it! Another annoying shortcoming is that the screen is completely crap under the sun. It is a matte finish screen rather than the glossy glass of your smartphone or something, so reflections aren't much of an issue, but it ranges from eye strainingly bad to utterly unreadable in direct sun. Under moderate shade, it's usable, and indoors, it's absolutely fine. But my advice for shooting outdoors is to grab yourself a viewfinder like this or some other kind of screen shade. It makes a universe of difference. Without a viewfinder or shade, the good-ish news is that because the camera is so small and lightweight anyway and so secure in one hand, shooting one-handed while using the other hand to try and shade the screen to get some visibility back is somewhat workable, although obviously not ideal. And what you see on the screen is vastly inferior to what you'll get in the file. The dynamic range that the screen shows you isn't even close to what's being recorded, especially when it comes to how much detail you're seeing in the shadows. So, the screen's good for settings, for framing, highlight exposure, and focus. But in general, it's far from being a good display, especially for a device of this kind aimed at professionals. Next up, the focus picking. Well, the focus picking on this camera is equal to the best out there, in my opinion. It is truly superb and wildly easy to nail focus every time and do smooth focus pulls. The contrast edge highlighting is clear, easy, accurate, and reliable, and you can switch it on and off at will with a simple double tap of the focus button. A single tap of that button, by the way, will engage the autofocus, so long as you're using a native Micro Four Third lens capable of autofocus. And while it's usually reliable, it is very slow and very jerky, so you won't be using this in any portion of any shot that you want to be using in your edit. The other focus assist feature is a one-to-one -one center crop, a double tap on the OK button zooms you right into the center of your frame at pixel for pixel level, allowing you to nail down critical focus easily. And if you like, you can even team this up with the other focus speaking mode. And both types of manual focus assist work with any lens, auto or manual, and even adapted lenses without any electronic connection at all. The iris button will automatically slam down your aperture to properly expose your frame. In film mode, this means it'll make sure there are no overexposed areas anywhere in the frame. And in video mode, this means it will meter for the center of the frame only. 
Another tip, by the way, shooting with ND filters is essential for this camera. Its native ISO is 800, and if you want to shoot anything outdoors with a shallow depth of field, or anything below the refraction hell of f22, an ND filter will be an essential accessory. Do not forget to put it in your bag, like I did one day, and instantly regretted it, because the camera is barely usable without one. So, on to the interface. It's basic. Very basic. It's exactly the same interface as the big Blackmagic cinema cameras have, so if you're familiar with those, you're familiar with this one. And in fact, they've designed the system to run off the exact same firmware, so all the cameras can update it at exactly the same time from the same firmware file. And that's awesome and very handy, but it's also a bit of an issue. See, those Big Brother models all have touch screens. The Pocket does not, and the interface was designed for touch screens. So, getting around and modifying modifying options, particularly with those with sliders, is much, much less efficient here than it is on the big boys. It's fiddly, and it's slow, and it's not entirely intuitive to dig around and move back out of. Text entry, like for entering the project name in the metadata settings, is atrociously old school. Without a touchscreen, you're relegated to pushing a cursor around an on-screen QWERTY keyboard and slapping on one letter at a time. So it can take half a dozen or more keystrokes just to enter one single letter. And it is agonizingly inefficient. That said, everything is laid out sensibly enough. Nothing is buried in submenu trees and it's clear at a glance what's going on. In the camera menu, you can change the camera identification. Useful if you're on a multi-camera shoot so your editor and the team can keep track of what was what. Date and time, obviously. Your sensitivity, oddly titled ISO, but the options read as ASA. Yes, sure, they're the same thing like Celsius and centigrade are for temperature, but it's just odd to use both in a digital camera in the same place in the same menu. And like I said earlier, its native and default setting is ASA 800. So stepping on either side of that will either cost you a little bit of dynamic range or introduce noise. We'll get to more on that in the next video where I look at the footage in bright and low light conditions. You can switch your white balance to all the common temperature settings, but you cannot enter a specific value. Not really going to be an issue, but worth pointing out all the same. The same thing goes for your shutter angle. You can't set a specific value for shutter speed, like those of you coming from consumer level hybrid cameras will be familiar with. Instead, it's the old school film speak shutter angle. Again, it's slightly odd, seeing as there is no mechanical shutter at all in this camera, which is what shutter angle used to refer to, but those trained in cinematography will be familiar with it anyway. And it is the more sensible way to go about things on a purpose-built camera like this. For audio, you can fiddle with your input levels, of course, and whether or not it's a line level source from a premixer or a microphone, and if you need to, you can force a dual mono recording. Under recording, you can select the ProRes option, and as soon as the new firmware hits, we'll also get a Cinema DNG RAW video option as well, which you can see is not out at the time I'm recording this, but I'm hoping it hits so I can do a few tests with Cinema DNG before I have to send the camera on to the next reviewer. You can select the dynamic range option, either film, which is as flat and as wide as possible, or video, which isn't quite as flat or wide, but looks a bit more familiar coming straight off the card. Everything you shoot will be at 1920 by 1080 and your frame rate options don't extend past 30 FPS. So those of you hoping for some sweet slow-mo stuff will have to look around for another tool. But what you do get is every other useful option below that. There's also a time-lapse mode. It's fairly limited, only giving you some set options of frame rate, but no ability to set total recording time. But the breadth of frame rates should satisfy most time lapses. And finally, the display settings. You can set the display to dynamic range independently from what's recorded, which may be useful for some, but considering the quality of the screen, it doesn't actually make that much of a difference, if I'm honest with you. You can fiddle with your brightness, of course, and you can set where your overexposure zebra peaking triggers, incrementally from 75% up to 100% or turn it off completely. Another pro tip, by the way, considering how this camera deals with overexposure, you do not want to turn off the zebras. You really, really, really want to keep an eye on your overexposure. But more on that, again, in the next video when we look at what the camera spits out. Finally, for the menus, there's the HDMI overlays. You can either have a completely clean, full-resolution output, 
which is wonderful if you're recording to an external deck, or you can choose to have some or all of the overlays displayed if you're simply using an external display for monitoring. So that's the end of my end-to-end -end of the hardware. In the upcoming videos you'll get to see the performance, and although the hardware has its issues, what it spits out is inarguably far more important. And here too there will be some very good news, and a few, oh man, kind of moments to keep an eye on. So as they say, stay tuned for that. Same bat channel, same bat place. Uh, time may vary. Thanks for watching, I am Blunty, I hope this has been useful, and I'll catch you next time.